construction. Oceanwide Plaza will boast three high-rise towers, one of them a five-star hotel. It will provide 500 luxury housing units and 183 new hotel rooms for L.A. It's the first project in the U.S. by the Oceanwide Holdings Company, one of China's largest business conglomerates. With the joint efforts, the economic integration between China and the United States is becoming more and more close. The continuing expansion of the downtown L.A. renaissance has helped fuel this international interest. This project represents yet another significant example of the confidence that international investors are showing in Los Angeles. We not only have the most visitors from China, the most uh, residents of Chinese descent, um, that we have the most investment and companies from China, we also have the most students from China. And they're the next generation of investing and in feeling like Los Angeles is their home. The project will also include commercial space, including a two-story shopping galleria, restaurants, a rooftop pool, health spa, and nightclub. Every great city needs a great downtown. This is where we interchange with culture. This is where we interchange with commerce. This is where the jobs are created. And we're now moving in that direction for downtown L.A. We're providing that hub that we've always dreamed about. The project will provide thousands of construction as well as permanent jobs for Angelinos. It is scheduled to open in 2018. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. Oceanwide Plaza is surrounded by L.A. Live, Staples Center, and the South Park neighborhood. Cinemark, one of the largest movie theater companies in the country, has raised the curtain on a brand new theater in Playa Vista, and officials say it's just the beginning of the area's transformation. Yana Kay reports. With its lavish seating and enormous movie screen, this new state-of-the-art Cinemark movie theater is now open for business in Playa Vista. Executives say the theater is not only luxurious, but one of the most technologically advanced, offering a 450-seat auditorium, 70-foot ceiling-to-floor screen, and state-of-the-art audio formats with more than 60 speakers. It also comes with luxury lounger recliners that lie flat and a reserve lounge. Moviegoers will also be able to order beer, wine, and high-end food. It's a great place to come and enjoy dinner. Uh, the loungers actually have tables, so you can eat your dinner while you're watching the movie, and it's an extremely comfortable environment. It's a great venue for escaping and going out and watching a great movie. City officials and executives gathered to officially open Cinemark's state-of-the-art nine-screen movie theater at Runway in Playa Vista. The ability to use these theaters not just for movies, but to communicate across the country and across the world, this is befitting the entertainment capital of the world. The new theater will be part of Runway Playa Vista, a new mixed-use development that will offer residents and tourists a wide range of services, including high-end restaurants, retail shops, and other amenities. Plazas located throughout the property or people gathering places, water features, fire pits, extensive common area furniture that's going to help promote that stay-a-while concept, if you will. The theater will bring 100 new jobs to Playa Vista. City officials say the area will eventually grow to house more than 13,000 residents. This is Playa Vista alive. This is the fulfillment of the promise that people have waited over a decade for. A fulfillment that officials hope will bring even more development to the area. I'm Yana Kay for L.A. This Week. L.A. already has an earthquake plan to retrofit many of its most vulnerable buildings in the next 5 to 25 years, but many owners can't afford it. Now, at last, they might get a financial incentive in the form of a proposed state tax break. Anna Marcos explains. Van Nuys City Hall may be old and historic, but its earthquake readiness is up to date. The entire building has been seismically retrofitted. City and state leaders are hoping a proposed tax break encourages more property owners to do the same for their older buildings. Assemblymember Adrian Nazarian has introduced Assembly Bill 428, which would give building owners a five-year 30% tax credit for retrofitting their buildings. The benefits to this tax credit are enormous. On average, a dollar spent to reduce disaster losses provides the nation about four dollars in future benefits. When disaster hits, we will have prepared in a way that saves lives, saves property, and just as importantly, saves Los Angeles itself. City leaders have joined with Nazarian to support the measure. The bill fits in with Mayor Eric Garcetti's plan to make L.A. earthquake safe before the next big one hits. He believes it will be much worse than
than the 1994 Northridge quake. This bill encourages building owners to take action now. Earthquakes, they don't understand municipal boundaries. And we have got to prepare ourselves not just as a city, but we need to work with government across the board. The city of L.A. has come up with much stricter earthquake building codes for newer structures in the last 40 years. But there are still more than 1,500 concrete vulnerable buildings and more than 11,000 soft story buildings, which could crumble during a quake at any time. The soft story challenge that we have here in the San Fernando Valley um, is especially pronounced. These are the very same buildings that provide us with so much of our affordable housing in the San Fernando Valley, much of it rent controlled. At the same time, many of these buildings are owned by mom and pop apartment building owners who don't necessarily have the resources to do the upgrades. The bill now goes to committee before being heard by the full state assembly, then making the rounds in the legislature. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. Mayor Eric Garcetti's own earthquake plan, which sets deadlines for the retrofitting of L.A.'s most vulnerable buildings, is called Resilience by Design. Two communities take the initiative to beautify their neighborhoods without waiting for the city to do all the heavy lifting. Gil Reyes shows us some get-up-and-go spirit from the valley. In Pacoima, this happy mom walks away with a new apricot tree to decorate her yard. She can thank the local nonprofit group Tree People for giving away some 400 fruit trees free. No condition. They can just come, they register, they have to take a workshop on how to take care and plant their tree correctly, and then they can come and get a tree. That's it. Tree People has organized planting workshops and tree giveaways throughout L.A. County for nearly 30 years. Donations make this possible. This time, Tree People partners with Councilman Felipe Fuentes and community group Pacoima Beautiful to spruce up one of the valley's oldest neighborhoods. Fruit trees provide more than just garden decor and healthy eating. So what that means is we cool down our environment, and doing that is far more inexpensive from a resource perspective than turning on your air conditioners. Hey. Weeks later, Councilman Fuentes joined another group taking action to improve their surroundings. That's the Lakeview Terrace Improvement Association. Volunteers cleared out weeds and picked up trash along a two-mile stretch of Van Nuys Boulevard. Everyone has a responsibility to keep their property up and come out and make sure the front of their property is kept clean. If there's a problem, they can call the city and the city will respond. For help with bigger problems like graffiti removal and bulky item pickup, you can call the city's helpline, 311 for assistance. Otherwise, there is no rule against fixing smaller problems on your own, or better yet, with friends and neighbors. In Lakeview Terrace, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Councilman Fuentes also recently teamed with volunteers to freshen up Dyer Elementary School in Silmar. An LA firefighter fallen in the line of duty gets a permanent memorial and a floor dedicated in his honor. But he has plenty of company as five other fallen comrades are also remembered. Anna Marcos has the story. He collapsed and died while on duty overseeing the LA Fire Department's Metropolitan Dispatch Call Center. And now Fire Captain Matthew McKnight is getting honored with the unveiling of this memorial. He died of a job-related medical condition. McKnight will also get an entire floor at the dispatch center renamed after him. When I think about Matt, I think of solid, smart, methodical. I knew Matt as a staff assistant first, had some big fires with Matt. And just like I said, he was methodical, organized, he was preemptive, he was ready for the next step at all times. About 26 firefighters and civilians and four officers manned the LAFD Metropolitan Fire Communications Center, taking about 2,500 emergency calls from citizens each day. It can be a stressful and demanding job. City leaders are also honoring five other firefighters at the dispatch center who died while on active duty. Nothing will ever make up for the loss, I know that, of Captain McKnight and these other heroes. But today we do celebrate. We celebrate not a sad occasion as much as it pains us that they're not here. We celebrate greatness. McKnight died in August of 2013 after serving the city for more than 31 years. He leaves behind a wife, two children, and two firefighter brothers. But his memory lives on along with his fire axe and helmet, which now become part of the permanent memorial in his honor. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. 
The other five firefighters honored were Peter Rose, John Scott Phillips, Michael Hallett, Juan Ojeda, and Rainer Montiel. An expo that showcases the latest technological advances for people living with disabilities. A man faces criminal charges after a nine-year-old child takes a gun to school. And a new park opens in West L.A. These stories in City Beat. The annual Abilities Expo took place earlier this month at the Los Angeles Convention Center and brought out those with disabilities, their caretakers, and service providers in search of resources, information, and devices. The event showcases cutting-edge technology and educational information for the disabled community. Workshops, demonstrations, and performances were featured, including an adaptive dance class showing that even those with limited physical range can still enjoy exercising and dancing. We see technology making giant changes to what people with a disability can do. It kind of narrows the gap and helps equal things so that uh, people with a disability are able to do so many more things that just anybody else can do. I'm a paraplegic. I was in a motorcycle accident in 2008, and the Abilities Expo is ways to make disability ability, no matter what situation you're in, regardless if you can walk or not walk. Vendors showcased items ranging from the latest models and wheelchairs to modified vehicles. The L.A. City Attorney's Office has filed a criminal case against a Valley resident for allowing a nine-year-old child to take a loaded semi-automatic weapon to school after reportedly finding it under a dog bed. Two other guns were also found in the home that were also allegedly not properly stored. We allege that a nine-year-old boy bought, brought a loaded semi-automatic weapon to his Tarzana Elementary School. It was loaded we allege, with a magazine containing 11 rounds. City attorney Mike Fewer said a member of the school staff noticed the gun and brought it to the attention of law enforcement. This is the third and latest criminal charge of this kind filed by the city attorney's office to increase gun safety through public awareness and education. Carthay Circle Park in West L.A. has reopened with a brand new irrigation system. The improvements to conserve water were a result of a partnership between the Department of Recreation and Parks and the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. In addition to the new irrigation system, Carthay Circle Park now features regionally compatible grass, plants, and decomposed granite pathways. These changes translate into approximately 243 gallons of water saved. <laughs> It's a park and rec center named after the singer who made the song La Bamba famous. The Richie Valens Rec Center has undergone some rehab to make playing here a lot more kid-friendly and earth-friendly, too. Anna Marcos has more. Even adults turn into children at the thought of running over the brand-new turf at the Richie Valens Rec Center soccer field. And council member Felipe Fuentes is the biggest kid of all as he leads his young charges. I love running in the grass a lot. There was a lot of rocks so that when you fell down in the grass, it would hurt. And so not only have we made the grass nicer and the ground softer, we've done it in a way that we're going to go ahead and water smarter so that we don't waste water. The soccer field not only has new turf, but a new irrigation system that's water efficient. We chose this park because it had the original irrigation system that had been completely was, was falling apart and it was not maintainable anymore. The earth friendly features mean better water conservation. This newly revamped soccer field will save the city 5 million gallons of water each year. The snowfalls have been diminished and, uh, and the water is getting less. We're doing more with less at this park. Yay! Less water used and more green underfoot. The kids, it seems, are happy to have all that green to run on. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. In this week's list of things to do, the Big Bunny Spring Fling at the zoo, an antique kimono market, and the L.A. Harbor Film Festival. The LA Zoo is celebrating spring with three days of exciting activities as part of its Big Bunny Spring Fling from Friday, April 3rd through Sunday, April 5th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day. Fun for youngsters includes photos with Big Bunny as well as the chance to pet real bunnies. There's face painting, musical entertainment, and costumed characters. 
All activities are free with paid zoo admission, except Big Bunny photos, which are available for a nominal fee. The Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens is located in Griffith Park at 5333 Zoo Drive. Go to lazoo.org. If you are interested in Japanese fashion and culture, the antique kimono and hagire pop-up market on Saturday, April 4th can't be missed. It takes place at the Craft and Folk Art Museum at 5814 Wilshire Boulevard from noon to 4 p.m. The event is produced by Rinko Kimino, an established Japanese author, designer, and kimono expert who serves as a cultural ambassador by introducing goods well-known in Japan to an American marketplace. Rinko will be bringing antique kimonos and obis, as well as hagire, small pieces of kimono fabric, ready to be imagined into something beautiful. Go to cafam.org slash programs for details. And the annual L.A. Harbor International Film Festival is here from Thursday, April 9th to Sunday, the 12th. The popular Read the Book, See the Movie event kicks off the festival on Thursday, April 9th. This year's selection is The Red Pony by Nobel Prize author John Steinbeck and the 1949 movie version starring Robert Mitchum and Myrna Loy. The film being shown on Friday, April 10th, the official opening night, will be The Magnificent Seven. All films will be shown at Warner Grand Theater located at 478 West 6th Street in historic downtown San Pedro. For times and the complete film festival schedule, go to laharborfilmfest.com. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. While most of us celebrate the new year in winter, many cultures celebrate the new year in the spring. And over at City Hall, city leaders helped usher in Persian New Year in council chambers, as well as with a special reception in the City Hall Rotunda. Persian New Year, or Nowruz, is celebrated by Iranian Americans of varying faiths. The diversity in their ethnic and religious background, Baha'i, Jewish, Armenian, and Muslim, represents the strength of diversity within the Persian community as well. It's common when celebrating Nowruz to set up a traditional table setting known as the half scene, which includes seven items, all starting with the letter S in the Persian alphabet. Nowruz literally means new day and begins on the first day of spring at the moment of the equinox. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. Escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. Get Fire Adapted now. Learn simple steps at fireadapted.org. Car accident deaths are a possibility, a probability. What if you don't get a chance to say goodbye? What if there are no more birthday celebrations or friendly conversations because you're just not here? Put the phone down. Practice hands-free driving. Give yourself and others a chance to participate in life. Obey the rules of the road. Hi, I'm Kevin from Chatsworth, offering you a taste of New Orleans since 1986. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35. Our city, our channel.
Good morning, good morning. Welcome to your Los Angeles City Council. This council meets, no applause, this council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. and the public is welcome. Today is Tuesday, shh, Tuesday, March 31st. And again, all is welcome. Mr. Clerk, I believe we have a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Bloomingfield, Bonner, Bisco, Nero, Cedillo, and Gunnar Fuentes, Vizar, Cores, Cocorin, Labonte, Martinez, and Farrell Parks, Price, West, and 10 members present and quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Fuentes moves. Wezar seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Martinez moves. Laban seconds. Next. Mr. President, today is Tuesday, and now it would be time for the flag salute. Okay, if we could all rise, we'll be led uh, today by Mr. Fuentes. Thank you, Mr. President. If everybody would put their right hand over their heart and repeat after me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, uh, sir. Let's, uh, Mr. Uh, Clerk, run through the agenda. Very good, sir. Um, Mr. President, before doing so, there is a request from the Department of Building and Safety to continue item 1A to April 14. Further, uh, there is a request from member to continue items 11, 12, and 13 to April 15. Okay, so without objection, that will be the order. That brings us where? Very good, sir. Items 1 and 2 are items noticed for public hearing. The Department of Building and Safety recommends that items 1J be received and filed in as much as the lien has been paid in full and that 1Q be received and filed in as much as the property was determined to be an owner-occupied single-family dwelling. We do have cards on both items, sir. Okay. Um, so that'll take us where? That takes us uh, to items 3 through 21. They're items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, members three through 21, do we have any specials? I do not see any. Why don't we prepare to vote on these items? Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. Mr. LeBange. Teen, I just need to ask staff a question. For we staff. already voted on it, Mr. LeBange. I got LeBange. that, but I'm going to ask him on the side, Mr. President. Okay, let's find the staff so they can accommodate Mr. Uh, LeBange. And, Mr. President, yes. excuse me, for item number four, that ordinance will go over to April 14 for a second read unless reconsidered later with 12 members. Okay. Mr. President. Yes. Uh, notwithstanding making sure that Mr. LeBange's concerns are heard, I'd like to move uh, 18 forthwith. Okay. I, I agree. I just had a question. Okay. You're good? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Forthwith. Uh, Mr. Clerk, that brings us where? 
Mr. President, that brings us to uh, items 20 through, excuse me, 22 through 29. There are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Do we have cards? Yes, sir, we do. We have cards on items 22, 24, 26, 27, and 28. Okay, let's hold those items and prepare to vote on the remaining items. I don't see uh, any members on the queue. Let's prepare to vote on those items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Okay, that brings us to items 30 through 32, correct? Yes, sir. Those are items scheduled for closed session. Would you like to hold them on the desk? I think we should hold those items for now. That brings us where? Very good, sir. On the supplemental agenda, item 33 is an item for which a public hearing has been held. Scheduled to be held. All right, so let's take up that, that item. I don't see any members on the queue. Let's prepare to vote. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate. Ten ayes. Okay, that moves. That brings us to item 34. It's an item for which a public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, that item is now be... Uh, we're uh, circulating a substitute amendment on that one to make a technical correction. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll just uh, continue, not continue, we'll hold that on the desk until everything is circulated. So... Very good, sir. Let's uh, return to the beginning of the agenda it should bring us to presentations, Mr. Clerk? Yes, sir, that or is correct. Or introductions. I want to introduce in the back, we have our former city attorney is here, Rocky Dugadillo. Give Rocky a round of applause, Ralph. Rocky, good to see you again. Mr. City Attorney. Question, Mr. President. I'm sorry, isn't there an ordinance that there's only two guys from Franklin allowed in council chambers at any one time? No, thanks. We lifted that, uh, Mr. LeBond, so we could have more. Okay, so... Um in fact, you know what? I'm, I'm going to take care of a couple of uh, housekeeping issues, members, before we get to the presentation. Let's go to item 22, uh, Mr. Murphy, item 22, John Murphy. Good morning, Herb. Item 22, I am against this item. Thank you, sir. All right, members, let us prepare to uh, vote on this item. Let us open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Now we'll move to item 26, Mr. Walsh. Item 26, Mr. Walsh. Yes, sir, Mr. Walsh. Yes, yeah, so John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org or J. Walsh Confidential tweeting at Hollywood Dems. I can't believe this. This city has a multi-billion dollar debt to repair the water pipes. And what are you doing with your m money? You are financing graffiti artists. You want to pay them $3,460 to, uh, to decorate traffic signal utility boxes. Look. You can have them do it for nothing. Just tell the cops to let them do it. They'll do it for nothing. Instead, you want, hey, three and a half thousand dollars here, three and a half thousand dollars uh, otherwise. I'm telling you right now, we don't need to spend $3,460 so that the, so the graffiti can splatter on the traffic boxes. Leave the traffic boxes stark staring naked. HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Brings us to item two. Mr. Walsh, item two. 
Pass. Mr. Walsh passes. Let's prepare to vote on this item. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Mr. Walsh, item 28. No applause. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. This one uh, doesn't even have the amount of money, I understand, is something like a half million dollars for funding for the improvement of the Devonshire Police Station. That should be included under the LAPD budget. That's the way we always did it. When I arrived here, Mayor Sam was the mayor, okay? I knew Sam Yorty. That's how far back I go. And always went out of the police box to me. It's, uh, it's a mere $50,000. What are you going to do? Set up a massage parlor in the Devonshire Police Station? See, they don't tell you what they're going to do. 50000 here, 50000 there. And the only answer to this, and, and, the, and the reporters here, they're all asleep because they're in love with, with the mayor. We don't need the $50,000 spent it on unknown improvements. Okay, thank you. Let us uh, prepare to vote on this item. Yo, know, you put it in late, but here, give it to me. All right, Mr. Herman. Start his time. Come on, Mr. Herman. The pressure's on, folks, and I'm back as death for the funding and the improvements. Not to say that I'm against any officers being paid, but $50,000 could be used for one overtime of a ghost cop car in our neighborhoods, any neighborhood. But as you see, on the public safety, Mr. Mitch Englander. Stay on the subject. His name is on the paper, Stay on sir. the subject. Again, the motion for relative funding for public safety by the Devonshire Police Station, recommendation by the approval of the lick-sucking, poking-toking, whoever person here, to allocate $50,000, as John Walls pointed out. John Walsh is always right, and Mr. Herman is always off topic, but today I represent this motion 28. I oppose to it because we don't need any more sweatshops for soliciting sex behind closed doors. We should use the direct process of the city clerk to prepare this necessary document to say that all LAPD should be funded adequately for any improvements in any division, not just in the Valley, as CD12, Mr. Englander's in, along with Nuri Martinez, as all of you have heard, there are how many massage parlors there? And I would know, I get the best massage there ever. But that's off topic and irrelevant, Dion. And I'm gonna finish now. Let the city clerk authorize and make technical corrections to this motion. This is a big joke. Public interest, you're not involved. Thank you, Mr. Okay, let's prepare to vote on that item. No, let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Sean Murphy, 24. Item 24, Sean. Followed by Mr. Walsh, item 24. Sean, no, Sean's here. Change my mind. Item 24, so again, I'm against this item. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh. I'm John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org, J. Walsh Confidential, or tweeting at Hollywood Dems. This is my favorite item. $50,000 of our money going 
for a, uh, and this is, uh, this is federal money that you control, okay? And, he, and what are you going to spend it on? Fixing the streets? Oh, no, 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 can't do that. They're going to uh, spend $50,000 to fund a community sit-down restaurant at this uh, village project. Ladies and gentlemen, are you socialists? Are you communists? In America, let free enterprise spend their own money. To, this is a sit-down restaurant for profit. They're not going to speak about it. They're not going to say a damn thing. $50,000 there, $50,000. Quiet. The, LA, the press is sleeping. HollywoodHighlands.org. Let's prepare to vote. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Weezar, would you like to move forward with your presentation? Sure. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, here in the city of Los Angeles, we've had a long history with the arts. Uh, we've had many individuals who made, have made a mark in the artistic community. And a lot of them have lived here in downtown LA. Uh, and believe it or not, when downtown LA was lost and forgotten and abandoned, uh, there are still the artists who lived here and who promoted uh, their work, who continued to do a lot of their work here that had gotten uh, international recognition. And this morning, it gives me a great pleasure to honor in Council Chambers a great American sculptor that was one of the earliest leaders of the Los Angeles art scene. And we have with us today John Mason. Where are you, John? There you go. And uh, he's uh, joined us with his wife, Bernita Mason, uh, as well as family and friends. And we want to acknowledge John as well because he is 88 years young uh, just yesterday so happy birthday <laughs> John was born in Madrid Nebraska in 1927 and raised in Fallon Nevada when he was and when he was 22 he moved to Los Angeles and enrolled at the Los Angeles Art Institute followed by the Charnard Art Institute in 1954 Mason worked with Peter Volkos with the ceramics department of the Los Angeles Art Institute. He worked in the studio at nighttime and during the day he worked independently. Volkos, who ran his classroom like a studio, worked alongside his students and gave them room for individual exploration. Volkos had a tremendous influence on Mason and the two artists became friends. By 1957, Mason and Volkos moved to a new studio that they shared on Glendale Boulevard. Between 1957 and 1965, Mason's work increased in size, which led him to question ceramics as a choice of medium. He then began to explore the properties of clay as a more appropriate medium for sculpting. In doing so, he opened the door for other artists to manipulate and use this medium as John Mason's work in the, last, in the past six dec decades has significantly influenced abstract sculpture, challenging the traditional notion of smaller, more vessel-like forms. He has influenced students throughout the country as a professor at Pomona College, UC Irvine, and Hunter College. Since retiring from Hunter College in New York, he has served as a visiting professor at USC, UCLA, Berkeley, and Mass Arts in Boston. And of all those, he told me that uh, his favorite was uh, Berkeley, my alma mater. Just kidding. <laughs> Go Bears. Mr. Mason's work has been displayed in national and international collections around the world from museums in Japan and Korea to museums in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Texas, and Minnesota. Locally, he has been part of museum collections at Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. We are proud that he lives and works in downtown Los Angeles for his incredible career and accomplishments as a distinguished American sculptor that is part of the art scene here in downtown Los Angeles. We honor him today. So with that, let me ask John if he would share a few words with us. Welcome, John, and congratulations. 
Well, L.A. has been my home for uh, a good many years, and uh, uh, I've seen a lot of changes here. Uh, and uh, uh, what else can I say? <laughs> uh, um, anyway, it is a great honor to be here today. And um, uh, to see you all uh, in your uh, normal capacities. Um, so. He didn't know we were going to do this. Uh -oh. <laughs> so. I was not prepared. Otherwise, <laughs> I, I would have had my card. Uh -oh. <laughs> It's not uh, that I'm not capable of it, but I'm a little surprised. Uh, so I'll say thank you very much. Uh, and uh, what's the other thing we say? Have a good day. <laughs> thank thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, sir. So John, on behalf of the City of Los Angeles and the City Council, it's my great pleasure to present this resolution for your legacy and influence in abstract and contemporary sculpture. Congratulations and thanks for reminding people about the art scene we have here in downtown LA in all the city of Los Angeles. Congratulations. At this time, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Mr. Mike Bonin of the Great 11th District for a very special presentation. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, today, I am joined uh, by Jackie DuPont Walker, one of my fellow directors on the uh, LA County Metro Board of Directors. Together, we represent half of Team LA. Uh, Mr. Krikorian and uh, Mr. Garcetti uh, were called away by another event this morning. But we're here today to honor uh, bus operator 1078, uh, Mr. Art Leahy, who is uh, stepping down. Art is stepping down as CEO of Metro. Uh, he is, however, not going far. He's actually going to Metrolink. Uh, in fact, that's why Mr. Krikorian really isn't here today, because he said he's going to keep busting you over at Metrolink, so he didn't want to be uh, praising you today. Uh, Art has been the CEO of LA County Metro since 2009, and uh, in the five or six years he has been there, he has made a tremendous imprint, and he is going to leave a tremendous legacy. He took that position shortly after voters had approved Measure R. And in that capacity, in that capacity as CEO, he suddenly was in charge of the largest public works project in the history of the United States. On his watch, we have done more to transform transportation in Los Angeles than has ever been done. Uh, on his watch, uh, the Expo Line. On his watch, uh, the Gold Line Foothill Extension. Uh, started work on the Regional Connector started work on the Purple Line uh, subway, uh, and uh, most importantly uh, to Mr. Pont Walker, uh, started work on the Crenshaw LAX line. While CEO of Metro, though, Art did more than those massive, game-changing physical improvements. Art also changed the culture of Metro to put a premium on passenger experience. As someone who operated our buses for a number of years, he knew that it was important to get, to get moving on all the deferred maintenance. He knew it was important to put a premium on getting the buses there on time and getting the buses cleaner. 
He also changed the culture of the agency so that a beleaguered transit agency such as Metro became a, a world-class destination. If you're a transportation expert in the city, in the, in, the, in the United States, the place that was coveted, the job that you wanted across the country was to work for LA County Metro under, over the past few years. Uh, that's a remarkable, remarkable legacy to have made in just such a few short years. Um, all the things I just said, though, a lot of people have been talking about for the past few weeks uh, as we've been doing the farewells and tributes to art. Uh, it's also important to note that before he took the helm of Metro, he was uh, the CEO of the Orange County Transit System and the Twin City Transit System. In Minneapolis, he actually increased ridership on his watch by about 20% after a decline of several years. But before that, before he left that, before he was in Orange County or in Minneapolis, he worked for RTD and then later Metro for a number of years. From 1971 to 1996, he started, as I said, as a bus operator, and he left as director of operations. And some of the things that happened on his watch as director of operations and as assistant director was in 1990, they opened the first light rail line in Los Angeles, the blue line. In 1993, the red line. In 1995, the green line. And in 1997, he did a whole bunch of groundbreaking things at Metro over alternative fuels and technology. Um, it is a family business for art. As I said, he was a, a bus operator in college. Uh, he followed in the footsteps of his parents, Art Sr. and uh, Janie. Is Janie your mom's name? Uh, Janie, who were both um, uh, bus operators. And uh, his wife, Lee, who I wish she's here because I love making fun of Art in front of his wife, uh, was also a bus operator. That's when they met. They actually didn't like each other very much when they first met. And she actually beat him out for a job, which she will tell you she reminds him of constantly. Uh, and, his, and his brother Mike is uh, also uh, a former operator and a transportation official. Uh, he has uh, left an incredible legacy. This is what he lives and breathes. Uh, but frankly, the thing I like best about Art is um, there's something very Irish about him. Uh, he has a gift for storytelling, a gift for humor, and uh, my grandmother would call it a gift for Blarney. Uh, and I've appreciated working with you because of that, Art. Uh, Jackie? Uh, thank you, Councilman Vaughn, and to President Weston Welcome. and members of the City uh, Council. Uh, I join in the chorus commending Art Leahy, uh, but we didn't finish the family tree. There was also the sister Deborah, who was a phone operator at Metro. We know the transportation is in the Leahy blood, and so we look forward to things happening at Metro that are extremely important. But we also want you to know how uh, much of a champion he has been for this region in Washington. There is a new chant in Washington, and it says, why is all the money going to L.A.? Why is all the money going to L.A.? And so we thank Art for having been that champion to bring billions here to build out our transportation system, and particularly important in this diverse community, the fact that he has taken very seriously local hire. We have the first project labor agreement in the nation that has now led to Congresswoman Bass being able to put forward legislation that has passed miraculously both houses in the 113th Congress. And so Art Leahy leaves a rich legacy at Metro, and we are very proud that he will be continuing at Metrolink. And so we join with you today in commending this champion of transportation, Art Leahy. Before uh, we, we hear from Art, there's a member or two that would like to say a few things. I, I think I want to start off by saying it was an honor to serve with you uh, when I was on the Expo uh, uh, board. And, and I guess the thing that makes Art so special is that he did start at, at the ground and worked his way all the way up. He has a very unique respect for all people. And I think that that's why, for many of us, he's uh, uh, beloved. And, and, and it's easy to get him to go out if you need a meeting or what have you. And these are the kinds of things that I'm going to uh, uh, remember, Art, and still look forward to working with you in the future. But you're an you're a, a, a excellent uh, professional, but you're a better man. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. LaBange. Thank you very much. I want to... Thank Mr. Bonin, Ms. Walker, 
And Mr. Wesson, you're so right about someone who leads. And I always, you talked about being Irish, Mr. Bonin. William Mulholland was a leader who made things happen for Southern California, for Los Angeles. Art Leahy was a great leader who made it happen. So much was stalled and not moving. And he knew how to put the stars together and make it happen. And I'm just very proud of him. I'm proud that he has this opportunity with Metrolink to help that agency and see more of an integration. I want to see all the lines from Glendale come into the Glendale Transportation Center there, the Larry Zarian Center right there near Atwater, so they could shuttle downtown faster. And I want to see a stop for the zoo, a little stop between Burbank, I got a lobby when I can get them, right between Burbank and the Colorado Boulevard and, and the 134. But uh, you look back in our history, uh, in 1968, there was a ballot initiative, and the Los Angeles Times did not support it. Yet, in the Bay Area, there was a ballot initiative. It was supported, and BART was built, and really has been a tremendous asset. The Bay Area is ahead of us, but ART, you put us right behind him, just by a nose now. You really, really, really have. And I, I think of the late, great Tom Bradley. I think of John Ferraro. I think of Julian Dixon, the late, great congressman, and all these people. And I think of convincing, finally, Henry Waxman that yes, we can deal with methane. Uh, yes, it was heavy rains that caused the pits out of La Brea tar pits to fill up and the gases and they, they way, figured a way to do that so that the, the busiest next to Manhattan, the most densely populated corridor will see subway service. And uh, Mr. Villaraigosa likes to brag the subway to the sea. I want the subway to USC coming down Vermont because Vermont is the busiest north-south corridor. But I'm leaving, so I look for my colleagues here. And I know Mr. Price is a young man. He's going to see it go south and connect it with Exposition Park and the Great Coliseum. But this is all what makes me proud and why Michael Bond, and I know you're a Massachusetts guy, but why I ask guys or women where they went to high school is I'm so proud when they went to Los Angeles schools. And he went to a great school in Northern League, Franklin High School. He drove the number 31 bus from Pasadena out to Hollywood, down Los Feliz. And us guys from Marshall, we wanted to go meet the girls from Hollywood, we'd jump on the 31. And Art would be there, and it was a 1948 General Motors, right? And we could push through the back door and get a couple guys in extra. But anyway, Art, you're truly an angel in the city of angels. I'm proud of you and the great celebration that the Southern California transit community gave to you last week was a great testimony. The speech by your wife was wonderful. And we're so lucky to have him stay in Southern California and work on transit. Art Leahy, Irishman of the Year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. LeBond. All right, Michael, not quite. Mr. Price. Th Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Art, I too just want to join those who uh, are going to miss you. We all know that uh, in addition to increasing ridership and opening up the, the new lines and being successful uh, as you were in D.C., getting monies back to uh, Los Angeles, you were also an advocate for small businesses uh, and emerging businesses. And, and certainly um, uh, many uh, of, of those uh, uh, kind of enterprises had uh, first opportunities, uh, opportunities to grow and expand their businesses, doing providing quality services, goods and services to, to Metro. So again, we appreciate your leadership in encouraging that kind of, of, uh, of effort uh, and commitment from Metro to the small business community. We're going to miss you. Thanks. Mr. Bonnet. Okay. So before I uh, take the, the high risk of giving Mr. Leahy the last word, uh, we have this proclamation for you, Art. Microphone is yours. Well, it's a, a great honor to be here. I'm, I'm very touched by, by this honor. I appreciate all the very kind words that have been said about me, although I am troubled about being discussed in the same paragraph as gas from the uh, tar pits. Um, anyway, it's been great to work at Metro. Uh, I am so pleased. I was in Washington a few weeks ago, and they are complaining about us. They're complaining about L.A. for the first time getting too much money. Good. They should complain because we are getting the money. I'm also, you know, you should know next year Metro's ridership rail only will pass BART for the first time in history. This city and this system is on the move. Thank you very much, Mr. President and Council Members. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonin, Mr. Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
you, uh, Art, again for all your service. You're a good man. And uh, thank you, Mr. Bonnet. Okay, let's uh, do item one. Mr. Walsh on item one, um, followed by Kenneth Call, maybe two. Please come forward. And uh, Kenneth, if you're here, just come on up. I hate, I hate that because it's a, one A through S. And that's why I hate what it is. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Uh, this are protests, building and safety. Uh, non-compliance code violations. This is what happens when you report your landlord and your landlord doesn't uh, take your unit and bring it up to uh, code. Remember, this is, a, this, when they do a good job, I'm the first to congratulate them. And they do a good job on this, finding landlords. However, if you're west of La Brea, they let those landlords go. They only go after landlords in South Central LA. Hollywood High, this is why you see Hart Street. Uh, these are all neighborhoods where uh, they allow minorities to be exploited, usually by white landlords. And uh, just to uh, fix, uh, to make the record straight, Art Leahy was fired by Garcetti. He is not talking about the item. Next speaker, Ken Cowell. And Madam President, if I may, uh, again, the department recommends that items J and Q be received and filed. Uh, J in as much as the lien has been paid, and Q in as much as uh, the subject property was determined to be uh, an owner-occupied single-family dwelling. Good morning, Madam President and council members. Uh, my name is Ken Goff, I'm a real estate attorney. I've been retained by the property owner, Gora Gambina, Gambil. She's the legal owner of a single family residence at 1109 North Ravine Avenue in Wilmington. Uh, she's retained me to dispute the imposition of late charges and a lien on her property on due process grounds. Uh, Ms. Gambina did not receive notice of these late charges or lien until approximately 30 days ago when a notice was posted on her property and the tenant there notified her of this proceeding. Um, her tenant, Lorena Rodriguez, had previously notified Ms. Gambino in 2012 that a city inspector had come by and noticed deficiencies. At that time, she retained the gentleman with me today, Rafael Blanco, to correct those violations. He did that promptly within 30 days. City inspector signed off on that. There was no exchange of papers, no left uh, no notices of charges. She had not heard anything further from the city until last month. She received a notice on the property that she owed not only in the inspection fee, but late charges of approximately eleven or twelve hundred dollars. Um, apparently, the city has been sending all the notices to the property to her former attorney, Alfred Cabrera in Glendale. He was deceased six years ago. She's not had any contact with his office since then. Uh, she's received no certified letters, no official mail, no personal service of any notices. Uh, I have with me today copies of a where her legal notices are sent. She gets her mortgage statement, she gets her lease payment, she gets all her notices sent to a P.O. Box in Wilmington at 1513, P.O. Box 1513, Wilmington, California, 90744. What Ms. Gabil is asking today is she's prepared to pay the inspection fee, but no late charges as she didn't have a chance to address those until 30 days ago. And at that time, I was just retained last week. Thank you. Sir, we're gonna have a staff member from Council District 15 come to the side bar here and speak to you on this item. We're gonna hold this on the table, please. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Herman. Well, you heard it, all of you, one minute about liens. What does it have to do with uh, CD12 again? $3,300 lien, another 
$3,700 lien. And another on Deborah Avenue, Mr. Englander, with the big ears, for $5,400. You heard the attorney, and we, John Walsh, have been telling you all along, you come here and protest, and they'll waive or have a conversation aside to reduce the inflated interest against your properties. Ms. Speaker, you must listen to this because it affects people in your own community. We, the people, need affordable housing. And this from Congressman Javier Becerra, this is what I think about your affordable housing because you know what? You need to stop the liens here, Javier Becerra, Congressman. He is not talking about this. Thank Senator. you. Keep your three seconds. Mr. Juan Alcala. Yes. You like to say you are an angel in the city of angels. I say you're a bunch of devils in the city of angels. You know why? Because you're driving the people homeless, you idiots, with all your liens. You are a homeless-making institution. Not only you, all the governments of all the states, all the governments of all the, the cities in the world, you are a bunch of thieves, liars, lawyers, etc. Uh, the LAPD across the street is harassing the people for vending on the street. So you guys are supposed to be able to make a living and the rest of the people? No. Right? Give me a lien for $1,967. Give me a lien for $3,923. Give me a lien for $3,900. Where the hell you think the people are going to get all this money? Where in the hell you get your money? From the people, right? So you are hired to punish the people, city attorney, Mr. Monopoly Man. What the hell are you people doing, you know? Everybody needs a place to live. There's more people out on the street than you can imagine. And all you do is put liens on people. Why don't you go back to the hell wherever you came from, you devils in the city of angels? That's what you are, bunch of devils in the city of angels. That's what you are. There's no more speakers on the queue. Mr. Clerk, please open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. And Madam uh, President, for clarification, again, items J and Q have been received and filed. Uh, the remaining items in that group, which is uh, letters C through S, uh, have been approved. Let's take up item 27, Mr. Clerk. Item 27 called special for cards. First speaker, Sean. Yes, good morning, Madam, Ch Madam Chair. Uh, item 27, I am for this item. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh at J. Walsh Confidential. Uh, this is item 27. Mind you, we have the worst sidewalks in America. That's you saying that, not me. Here you want to spend $4,401. I think that's what you make a day here. Uh, you're not going to guess what it is for. Pooper scoopers. Pooper scoopers. So that the feces coming out of the dog's rectum the steaming feces in Mr. Fuente's district and Mr. Weizar's district will not hit the ground. Wait a second. Let them buy their own damn pooper scoopers. Look, if anything I say isn't true, if this isn't for pooper scoopers, then correct me. 
funding of three pet waste receptacles. Take the pet wa waste receptacles and dump them on your head. HollywoodHighlands.org. Next speaker, Mr. Herman. It's getting poopy, scoopy warm in here, folks. But again, really, at a time when we need access for sidewalk and streets to fill up the potholes, why don't we stick the poopy, scoopy, doopy, doopy in the holes and maybe we could uh, slurry seal them shut, Mr. Um, Fuentes and Jose Weizar, who special interest gave them billions of dollars, but not one effing dollar went to our streets. Instead, we have here funding for the acquisition installation of three pet waste receptacles in a park area immediately adjacent to sidewalks. Hey, DOJ, FBI, investigate this because this is malicious fraud, waste, and abuse by elected officials who think that $4,401.75 is chump change, Mr. City Attorney, for the record. And again, Mr. City Attorney, for the record, it does state here, according to making any payment for Great Western Park and Playground, you know what, screw that, because the children need play equipment and not pooper scoopers, because I don't want to see any child in Los Angeles all you Angelino minorities picking up the cacada de quasha from dogs from the sidewalks and streets. That's the job of the city, public works, public works. And we, the taxpayers, all of you stakeholders should know this. Stop wasting money on fraudulent receptacles, receptacles, Mr. England, are you listening? Receptacles in park areas. Fix Hazard Park, put cagada pickers up in Hazard Park and Boyle Heights, and better fix the damn sidewalk and streets in Hazard Park, Boyle Heights, Public Works. Now you're going to be investigated by the Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway. Mr. Juan Alcala? I feel absolutely the same way. How, how can you buy? Three waste baskets for $4,000. Where the hell do they sell these baskets? Huh? It's not in downtown LA, because you can buy a basket for 10 bucks, not $4,000. What the hell is wrong with you people, once again? Don't you know what's going on in the city? Yesterday, Van Halen, in Hollywood, Mr. And Alcala, I'm wait, ask wait, the subject. I was stepping on dog shit over there. I was stepping on dog shit. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You're not going to solve any problem by putting three receptacles to put dog shit in. It's not a solution. It's just a stupid waste of money. And we do not agree with that. We agree with you fixing the sidewalks and doing a lot of other things that you actually need to do. You know, buying four, three trash cans for $4,000 does not cut it. Only the Army can do better than you. They buy hammers for $1,000. Only the Army can beat you at wasting money. You see? Would you say I rock? I rock. Yeah. But I don't want to be stepping on dog shit. Just sweep it to the street, you know? You don't need the baskets. I have no more cards in this item, Mr. Clerk, and no speakers on the queue. Open the, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Ten eyes. Thank you. Item 34. Madam President, um, if we could um, reconsider uh, for Council Member Huizar item 21. Okay, let's do 20, item 21, Mr. Clerk. 
Can we open up for consider? Open the road. Close the road. Tabulate the votes. Ten ayes. Madam President, that matter is now before you. Just hold it on the desk and take other matters until he gets back. Okay, then we'll go back to item 34. Madam President, item 34 was called special for cards. There has been a substitute motion uh, that has been circulated as well. Madam President, Mr. Uh, item 29, which is voted on earlier, uh, forthwith uh, for Councilmember Parks. Noted. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Item 34, I have two cards. Mr. Herman, you're out of time. Mr. Alcala. Sorry, there's one card. Uh, since I don't really know much about item 34, I'll just uh, state that I'm running for mayor of LA in two. He's uh, not talking about this item. Oh. Yeah, but I'll fix all this stuff if I become mayor. So I am actually talking about the item. Look, motion bonan Cedillo relative to asserting jurisdiction over the February 4, 2015 action of the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission of case number AA2013186. Mr. Bonin. I'll the dialogue on this issue. Uh, this is uh, a 245 item before us. Uh, I'm generally very reluctant to bring in a 245 item and, uh, and challenge the uh, uh, decision of the West LA Area Planning Commission, uh, but this one is a, a bit of a technical correction. Uh, this is an application for a, uh, a residential project on Sunset Avenue in Venice. Uh, in order to get approval, it needed to meet four criteria. Uh, the West LA APC determined that it met three of those criteria and denied it on the fourth. However, uh, since then, the planning department and the city attorney have determined that the city never should have sought the uh, the fourth requirement. Uh, so this uh, item is to assert jurisdiction and to turn it over to the Plum Committee uh, to uh, reconsider the matter. Uh, I have a, put a substitute motion in today in order to um, uh, make a technical correction to the original motion. Uh, thank you. Ask for an I vote. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Mr. Clark, we'll take up the substitute motion first. Very good, ma'am. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Madam President, we do now have the substitute motion before you. So open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Mr. Clerk? Yes. M Madam President, there has been uh, a request to reconsider uh, item 1S. Okay. Mr. Correct, did you want to speak? Yeah, uh, on that item, so when it's reconsidered. Open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. That matters now before you. Yes, and I would just like to ask uh, on behalf of uh, Mr. Kikorian that we uh, continue that item for one week. Mm, Madam President, uh, because of the recess, uh, that brings us to April 14. Without objection? Very good. So moved. Mr. Clerk, let's take up item 21. M Madam President, that's item 21 called special for cards. We have no cards and no speakers on the queue. Oh, uh, I believe Mr. Englander uh, asked that that matter be reconsidered and held on the desk. Open the row, close the row, tabulate the vote. 
Ten eyes. Mr. Clerk, let's go to general public comment. Sean. Uh, good morning. I want to thank, I want to congratulate my school for coming down here last week. I'm sorry I couldn't make it down here last week. Yay, L.A. High. Besides, I'll tell you, I'm a graduate of 82. We need to keep our streets cleaned, sidewalks repaired, libraries open. And that was a good presentation on the Met, Art Blakey. He was, I think he used to drive line 83 40 years ago. I might have seen him before. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Next speaker, Harriet Elliott. My name is Harriet Elliott. I came last time talking about my son's death almost 22 years ago. I want to ask the LA City Council if you will uh, uh, make a resolution to ask the LAPD to close my son's case. It's now open so that my private investigator can question witnesses. I want to say why I didn't uh, investigate this a long time ago. I, there was rumors about uh, gangs. However, um, my son did the best he ever did in the last year of high school, and his teacher said, um, he had no complaints about my son. Uh, I also am the victim of uh, a subterfuge. And even though I, you might wonder, well, you look like a gangbanger with your teeth gone. My dad was George Gammon. I'm wondering if Cedillo, Gil Cedillo didn't know my dad. Also, if Wesson didn't know my dad. He was a big, he was the head of, thank you, uh, thank you. head of DP, Department of Public Social Services. Mr. Walsh? John Walsh at J. Walsh Confidential. Vote for David Rue to replace LaBonge. I want to point out that the LA Times, Austin Butner, Shelby Grad, and Robert Green want you to take the sign off Franklin uh, Avenue that honors L. Ron Hubbard. It's been on the LA Now blog for two days. This is a, L. Ron Hubbard was a great man. He was a great writer. He was a great science fiction writer. His, 19 years ago, you put a sign up there, and now vicious, vile Scientology haters, and these are their names, these are the enemies of Scientology, Austin Butner, Mr. Shelby Grade, Grad, Mr. Robert Green, and Mr. David Zahnheiser. I ask, I ask Scientology to investigate this, because they're on, on behind are trying to take that sign off the street. Next speaker, Tommaso Grady. Good morning, City Council. Good morning. Um, my name is Tommaso Grady. I'm a recent uh, uh, candidate for Council District 4, and I'm here to speak to you briefly about the Villa Carlotta and rumors going around the city that it's up for a proposed zone change. I'm asking you to be on the watch out for this. It is a beautiful old historic building, and the tenants in that building have been served with the Ellis Act, and they're about to be evicted because the developer has insisted in public forums that he's guaranteed a zone change to change it to a hotel. I've also been authorized by the Carlin Ramsey campaign, one of the folks who have gotten into the runoff, and I quote that she is strongly opposed to any zone change that would allow that building to change from residential use to hotel use. Finally, let me say we have a housing crisis, and it's time for the City Council to consider legislation for a no-net loss policy for affordable housing units. Thank you, City Council. Thank you very much, Mr. Herman.
Is it unreasonable or unconstitutional just to provide us one minute when we're not going to exceed the time? That's racist and discrimination. And who is protected under the ADA and the Re Rehabilitation Act? All of us who are a person with a physical or a mental disability that limits one or more major life activities, a person who has previous history of an impairment as the elderly and the disabled, Mr. Koretz, and a person who is perceived as having a disability, although there is no functional limitation, an example would be someone with a cosmetic, facial disfigurement, big ears, scars, etc., scorn, contemptuous, like some of you, Mr. Englander, as you leave. Have a nice day. Public comment is First Amendment right. You have a right to freedom of speech. Listen in. Next speaker, Sarah Todd. Good morning, council members. My name is Sarah Todd. I had the honor of working with Tomas O'Grady as his chief of staff, which pro provided me the unprecedented opportunity to work with all the residents at the Villa Carlotta. What started out at each tenant just being a name turned into lifelong friendships that will, I will forever hold dear. I was able to witness the struggle that each individual endured as the new owners tore their home out from under them. I got to feel the pain as each individual and family member uh, left as they faced one social justice after another. I had the rare opportunity to communicate and work with, directly with the developers and their staff and see the lack of interest and care for the well-being of their tenants. I am asking three things. That as a legislative body, you support the passing of the measure that will curtail the Ellis abuse at a local and state level. Thank you. Next speaker, Sylvie Shane. Good morning, council members. My name is Sylvie Shane. I live at the historic Villa Carlotta in Council District 4. I am here today on behalf of the remaining tenants who are being evicted as a result of the Ellis Act. The clock is running out. We have 20 days remaining before it goes into effect and we begin receiving our eviction papers. I'm asking you for three things. That as a legislative body, you support the passing of measures that were, will curtail Ellis abuse at the local and state level. That you oppose any zoning change that will be proposed to change our home to a hotel or other use. With affordable housing supply diminishing and demand increasing, it makes little sense to take something with a perfectly viable and necessary use and change it. And thirdly, I'm humbly asking for our Councilman LaBange to please meet with the remaining tenants of the Carlotta who desperately need a champion. During the course of the CD4 election debates, Carolyn Ramsey told the story of a constituent who once called on you to remove a dead coyote from his yard, and you did. Please, Councilman LaBange, we need you to help remove our dead coyote. Thank you. Next speaker, Michaela Brinsley. Hello, my name is Michaela Brinsley. I am a junior at Oakwood School. I am here as a friend and supporter of the Villa Carlotta. As a representative of our school's theater department and social justice club's cultural awareness in Camasso, we are invested in the preservation of this building, way of life, and artistic community in Los Angeles. Our senior class is putting on a play, Hotel Baltimore, that parallels the situation at the Villa Carlotta, and the students and residents alike are working on the play and this project. We are asking you to oppose the zoning change, support Ellis Act reform, and meet with the residents of the Carlotta and support this cause. As artists, students, and residents of Los Angeles, it is imperative that we support this community and way of life and make sure that it is preserved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, next speaker, Maury McKaylee. Hi, council members. I'm Marley McAlilly. 
and I'm a student at Oakwood School as well. I represent part of the tech and theater initiative that is putting on Hotel Baltimore as part, as part of support in via, for the Via Carlotta. Because theater is an art influenced by so many things around us, we find it absolutely important to advocate for issues of social justice such as these. As a member of the tech crew, I've seen just how elemental the Via Carlotta has been in creating the set design and decoration of Hotel Baltimore. Our interviews with the residents also have been instrumental in the character development of the characters in the play. So again, I ask you to oppose the zoning, support Ellis Act reforms, and hold a meeting with the residents of the Via Carlotta. Thank you. Mr. Juan Alcala. I'm running for mayor of LA in two years, and I do not expect to win because it's always the same a-holes electing each other. So I'm not one insider. I'm not an insider, and I have a different agenda. My agenda is a little more real than yours. So if I get enough supporters, I'm running for mayor. I can beat these assholes. I really can, and I can do better than these assholes. I assure you, but you don't appreciate that kind of language, so I'll never get elected. So I'm just doing it for show, okay? Anyway, if you want to continue to be punished by the assholes that serve you, keep these assholes and uh, don't elect me. Yes, Mr. LaVange. I just want to let the students know that the federal judge allows all language in this court. So I want to, so anyone who's offended by that language, I want to let you know that. Thank you very much. Mr. Clerk, we're going to go into closed session now. Very good, ma'am. Sergeants, please help clear the room.
Mr. Clerk, we are now back in open session. Mr. Kokorian, to you for a presentation. Gary, you want to join me? In fact, you all want to join me? <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. I'm serious, Rocky. Come on up. Come on. Thank you very much, Madam President and members. Uh, it's an honor, but kind of a sad honor, that I come to you uh, to recognize and to thank Gary Geis for his extraordinary decades of service uh, to the city of Los Angeles and to wish him well on his uh, pending retirement from service uh, here to, to the, the taxpayers and the residents and uh, the members of, uh, of the city council as well. Um, Gary has provided exceptional service uh, to this city uh, in the city attorney's office for 26 years. Uh, he joined the city attorney's office as a deputy in 1989 in civil liability uh, and then was transferred soon thereafter to the criminal division in the San Fernando Valley. In two years, he tried over 35 cases to jury verdict involving things like spousal abuse, vehicular manslaughter, driving under the influence, and, and many other offenses. In 1995, Gary returned to the Civil Liability Division to defend the city in civil rights, wrongful death, and personal injury cases. And then in 2001, he was promoted to Assistant City Attorney and Division Supervisor. And he was pr promoted again in 2003 to Senior Assistant City Attorney, and yet again in 2005 as Chief of the Civil Liability Branch. Since 2013, Gary has undertaken uh, an unprecedented and vitally important role as head of the newly formed proprietary and risk management branch of the Office of the City Attorney. And he's worked very closely with the Budget and Finance Committee and uh, with others in the city to try to reduce the risk that this city faces to, to future liabilities before they happen. And it's, it's been a critically important role that I hope um, someone will be able to pursue as aggressively as Gary has uh, during his time here. Gary also serves as an ad adjunct professor at Southwestern University School of Law. Um, and in his spare time, he has run and completed 32 marathons, including six consecutive Boston marathons and He's a dive master and scuba instructor. So, um, you know, I, I'm lucky if I get to watch a TV show sometime in my <laughs> spare time. But Gary has managed not only to be one of the real leaders of the city attorney's office, um, but also been one of the um, one of the guardians of the public's uh, money as well. Uh, and uh, as a uh, member of the claims board with me, and then uh, through his risk management work, really Gary has been uh, one of the people who has uh, ensured that we reduce our risks, uh, but more importantly, that we stand firm against uh, claims that lack merit. Uh, and uh, litigate those aggressively. And I've very much valued his wise counsel, as have so many of you as he's come and sat at this table and advised us in, in closed session and otherwise. Uh, the city of Los Angeles's loss uh, will be the city of Riverside's gain as Gary steps up to the big chair and becomes the city attorney for the city of Riverside. So we're very, very proud of Gary's accomplishments here. We wish him all the best uh, in his future endeavors as city attorney of Riverside. Gary, thank you very much for your great service. And before we uh, ask you to speak, though, I think Corey Brent wants to come up and, and say a word or two. Thank you, council member. Thank you, council member. I think I know most of these council members. Uh, I'm Corey Brent. I'm the supervisor of the police litigation unit. I'm here with uh, some members of our unit. Uh, when I say your name, raise your hand. Stephanie Sullivan, Kelly Cadis, Denise Zimmerman, Daniel Lynch, Jeff Plowden, Melinda Crow, Ed Rathman, Margaret Avizian, Kathy Finan, and Sereka Pessis. And we're here because uh, Gary was our supervisor for a number of years, uh, 14 in total. And during the time he was our supervisor, he was an incredibly supportive of our entire section. Uh, and incredibly supportive then indirectly of the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department. And we always appreciated Gary and his leadership and the, his humanity and the way he uh, treated the deputies and the staff. 
So we have a presentation for Gary, and it is a plaque that I will present to him and I will read it. Um, it has our badge at the top. It says Chief Assistant City Attorney Gary G. Geis, Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. Presented by the lawyers and staff of PLU in recognition of your unwavering support of our unit and our mission, defending the men and women of the Los Angeles Police Department. Your leadership and humanity were on display each and every day, and for that you have our enduring respect. We wish you continued success on the road ahead. You will be missed. Thank you, Corey. And next, it's a great pleasure to welcome our city attorney, Mike Fuhr. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you, Councilmember Kikorian, very, very much. So this is a moment that is very melancholy for those within the city attorney's office. When I was growing up as a kid in San Bernardino, our competitive city was the city of Riverside. When I played ball, I used to take that team bus over to Riverside, and here we are. It's like 30 or whatever it is years later, and that pesky Riverside is back at it. Um, in the city attorney's office, there are few lawyers who have made a mark commensurate with that of Gary Geis. When I was on the city council, I knew well the respect with which Gary was held, both around this horseshoe and within the city attorney's office. And that respect is reflected in the array of Gary's accomplishments and the level of his leadership. He's ascended to the top of the charts in our city attorney's office, being in charge of our proprietary and risk management division being, branch, being in charge of the civil litigation in the city uh, attorney's office, serving, of course, on the claims board, and always doing so with great distinction. He is a highly valued member of the city family and someone who I think in this room has had an effect on everyone here, and more importantly, a positive impact on the people of the city of Los Angeles. Every day he has served us for the past uh, 26 years, is that right? For the past 26 years. So it is our loss, it is Riverside's gain, they owe us big, and, <laughs> but in the meantime, let me join everyone who is expressing very deep congratula congratulations to our friend and our colleague, Gary Geis. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. And uh, we're also joined by our city, one of our city attorney's predecessors, former city attorney, Rocky Delgadillo. Rocky. Thank you very much, Councilman. I also would like to thank Honorable council members for just giving me a moment to say a few words about an extraordinary lawyer. Uh, I cannot tell you how proud I am to just be associated with Gary Geis, even if it was for only eight years of his 26 here in the city. He saved this city millions of dollars every year. And um, now he's going to get to go do that for Riverside. They should be very thankful, be able to have more money for to make it spruce up the city with vis-a-vis -vis San Bernardino. Um, but Gary and I were in the trenches, he more than me, making a difference through one of the more troubling times in the city's history dealing with the whole Rampart scandal. And in the end, I think the city was a better place because of Gary Geis. And that's, there's no higher compliment that a public servant could receive than to say that they've done their job and done it well. And Gary Geis is that ultimate, penultimate public servant, and I'm proud to be associated with him. Thank you, Gary, for your years. Thank you, Mr. Delgadillo. It, every single day, uh, the lawyers of the city attorney's office serve the people of this city in ways that the people of this city never see. Uh, and may never be aware of uh, in preventing liability, 
uh, in prosecuting criminals, uh, in advising the city uh, leadership in uh, the legalities of the work that we do, in helping us to develop uh, sustainable ways to move forward in important policies that are important uh, for the people of Los Angeles. Uh, it's the men and women in the city attorney's office who do that for us uh, each and every day and often don't get thanked and don't get recognized. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be able to stand here with one of the real consummate professionals and leaders uh, in that office, somebody who I think serves as an example to all of the deputies uh, in the city attorney's office and, and hopefully will set that example for many years to come. Uh, our friend, please help me to welcome Gary Geis. Madam President, council members, I, I always wondered what it was like to speak at the podium because I never got that opportunity. I was always up there and it's a little nerve wracking. So I understand some of the speakers. Um, I was asked if, if when I was thinking of what to say, if I was getting choked up and I said, no, nah, it's not gonna be a problem. Well, it's kind of, actually kind of a problem. <laughs> with, with this and with what's been said, it, it is uh, quite a bit more difficult than what I had imagined. But as I usually say when I talk to council, I will be brief, <laughs> and I will be brief with you now. Um, 26 years ago, I started with the city attorney's office, and my plan was to work for two years and go back to the private sector where I came. And after those two years, I realized that some of the finest lawyers in the city of Los Angeles actually worked at the city attorney's office. And so I stayed. And I was so very happy that I did. Uh, my time in criminal was wonderful. Uh, my time in, in civil when I came back was, was marvelous. I want to thank uh, former city attorney Rocky Delgadillo for giving me the opportunity by making me branch chief of the civil litigation unit, some, a position that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Um, I, I want you all to know, and I think you all can appreciate that the representation and the work that you get from the city attorney's office is the best that you could ever imagine. And you are well served by all of those individuals that are behind me. Um, some of them have gone their way through retirement themselves and I thank you for coming out for me. Um, that's very, very nice. Um, and a lot of those that are still back there are still working for you every single day, making court appearances and doing your work and doing the city's work and the work for the citizens of Los Angeles. And you should be very, very confident that you're being represented well. And I thank you so much for this, this honor today. Thank you. Anna. Mr. Kokorian. Mr. Gordon, I'm sorry, we have Mr. Laban to say a few words. Oh, thank you very much. I just wanted to stand and rise and salute you, Gary, for your service. And I look at this building, it was built in 1928, and I look at these columns here in this chambers, and that's what city attorneys are. They hold these buildings up. They make sure things are straight and right uh, in the end. And uh, the work that you did, and uh, there was a different alphabet, Mr. Fuentes. I used to sit over on that side. <laughs> and next to me was Cindy Misikowski. And Sidney Mendeskowski, I believe, absolutely has read every report ever published by the city of Los Angeles that came to the council floor. And in the trying times of the Rampart matter, uh, we looked to Sidney, and she said, if Gary says it's so, it's so. And that's a big, big, big honor that people have that belief in you, Gary. I'm proud that you're still in Southern California. I'm proud you're still going to stay in the 4th District, although I won't be your council person. But... Uh, <laughs> you'll get on that 210 and go out to the county. And in some parts of the year, it's absolutely beautiful where you can see the mountains and it's a great county and the city of Riverside has great history there. But I really want to thank you and Mr. Fear and I see your new beard and I see, Mike, you got a new hairstyle too. I, something's going on in the <laughs> city attorney's office. Uh, but, uh, and Rocky, you look as good as you always did there from Franklin High. But behind you are the people of the pillars. Behind you and the support staff that's still over there because there has to be a, a, a curb. And inside the curb, there's a lane. And inside the lane, there's lines. And inside the lines, they got to make sure they work right. And that's what city attorneys do. And in the trying times of police litigation, because our officers are just from our schools who come to serve the city and, and the support that they need, 
uh, and the correction that is necessary is always a compliment. So I thank you, Gary, for your service to the great city of Los Angeles. Thank you. I'm sorry, and I would also like briefly just to say that my daughter, Caitlin Geis, has come here tonight. <laughs> my, my oldest daughter, Megan, couldn't make it, and a very special person in my life, Lisa May, is also here. That's it. Nothing more. Great. So, Gary, on behalf of the entire city council, um, the city attorney, and all of the people of Los Angeles whom we represent, it's a great pleasure to present you uh, with this resolution, with our thanks, with our gratitude, and all of our best wishes for your future. Congratulations. Mr. Kokorin, congratulations, Gary. We wish you tremendous success. Mr. Clerk, let's take up items 30, 31, and 32. Very good, Madam President. Uh, items 30 through 32 are items scheduled for closed session. Each is a second. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Gakorin? Thank you very much, Madam President. Uh, members, items 31, I'm sorry, 30, 31, and 32 agendized for closed session um, are uh, all matters, settlements that can be resolved in open session unless members have questions or comments. I would move the uh, Budget and Finance Committee reports uh, that, uh, it, that um, support the recommendations of the City Attorney as to each of those three matters. And Madam President, uh, for the recommendation for item 30 in the case entitled Sandra Thomas Moses et al. versus the City of Los Angeles, there is a recommendation to expend $500,000 in settlement. For item 31 in the case entitled Ahmed Jackson versus Justin Kravitz et al., there is a recommendation to expend $137,500 in settlement. And for item 32 in the case entitled Juana Isabel Flores Garcia versus City of Los Angeles et al., there is a recommendation to expend $1,350,000 in settlement. M Madam President, uh, item th we could now vote on item 30, uh, if, if you'd care for it. That's uh, Sandra Thomas Moses et al. versus City of Los Angeles. Item 30. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, one no. Next item. So that brings us to item 31, Ahmed Jackson versus Justin Kravitz et al. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, one no. And lastly, item 32, uh, that's the case entitled Juana Isabel Flores Garcia versus City of Los Angeles et al. <laughs> Open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Madam President, uh, council has motions for posting and referral. Posted and referred. Desk is clear. Members, any announcements? Mr. O'Farrell. Thank you, Madam President. I, I'm actually going to have two announcements. The first being that uh, today, Mike Bonin and I introduced a resolution, Transgender Day of Visibility in the City of Los Angeles. March 31st, today, is, is that very special day. It's an opportunity to honor the living, celebrate the accomplishments and contributions of the transgender community, and to create the leaders of tomorrow that will carry the banner of this resilient community. As most know, uh, the transgender community is often the most misunderstood and marginalized in all of society. I want to thank the local organizations that do great work, not only in my district, but also uh, across the city to improve the quality of life for this transgender community here in the City of Angels. And that includes St. John's Well Child and Family Center, Children's Hospital in Hollywood, 
LA uh, LGBT uh, Los Angeles Center, Bienestar, City of AIDS Coordinator's Office. I also want to acknowledge uh, Karina Samala. Uh, Karina continues to be a great public servant, raising awareness in this uh, community, and we really appreciate her role in the Human Relations Commission uh, here at City Hall. And also today in the LA Times, they profiled uh, transgender reporter Zoe Tur, formerly uh, Bob Tour, who is a, an Emmy-winning reporter who flies a helicopter. He states in the interview today in the LA Times that gender dys, uh, dysphoria uh, got pretty bad to the point of severe depression and suicide. So we're talking about a community that needs our support and awareness on this day of visibility. My second announcement uh, is I want to take an opportunity, indulge me colleagues, uh, to congratulate David Cano of my staff. David, please step forward. Um, Dave, here is my executive assistant and scheduler. Uh, he joined the city 10 years ago on March 29th, first working uh, for Jack Weiss as an administrative assistant, and he then became Jan Perry's uh, executive assistant in 2009 and joined my office uh, upon the first day uh, in July of 2013. Uh, Dave is, uh, in addition to his love of public service, uh, he is an advocate for the LGBT homeless youth, a former resident of a Hollywood shelter himself, uh, and has proudly coordinated the Los Angeles City Hall quarterly American Red Cross blood drives since 2006. Uh, Dave Cano, I and your colleagues love you very much and appreciate all your work, and here is your 10-year pin. Thank you, sir. You got it. This is in there. You are in. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Madam President. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Congratulations, Dave. Mr. LaVange, are you have any announcements? I want to thank everybody for the month, and uh, we've got a new month starting tomorrow. So yep. New month tomorrow. Mr. Gregorian. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, members, I'd like to announce that the Economic Development Committee will be meeting this evening in the San Fernando Valley beginning at 6 o'clock at Van Nuys City Hall for further discussion about the various proposals relating to increasing the minimum wage. Uh, so anyone who's in the Valley and like to come in and weigh in on that issue, uh, be heard on that issue, uh, it will be this evening, 6 o'clock at Van Nuys City Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. Gokor, and I will be there. Thank you for the uh, reminder. Anyone else? Any adjournments, members? Mr. Gokorian. Thank you, members. Uh, it's with sadness that I ask that the council adjourn uh, this meeting in honor and in memory of George Kalebjian. Uh, Mr. Kalebjian was born in April of 1931 in New York, the uh, son of genocide survivors of the Armenian Genocide, um, immigrants to this country who uh, endured the torment of that genocide and then brought that experience which helped shape uh, young George in his formative years and throughout his life and made him uh, a quiet and humble uh, but strong Armenian patriot and American patriot. Um, his mother was an orphan of the genocide and spent three years in a Near East Relief orphanage in Turkey uh, her, her, before her brother in New York finally found her through the help of the United States government and Near East Relief uh, and was able to reconnect to the family, bringing her here from the orphanage when she was just 14 years old. Her father... His, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Kalebjian's father had fled the Adana massacres in Turkey and immigrated to New York as well. Mr. Kalebjian took great pride in his people, his family, and his work, and he left this life content with his accomplishments. Uh, he passed away just a, a few weeks short of what would have been his 84th birthday, 
uh, and exactly one month short of the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Armenian Genocide that would play such an important role in forming who he was. He was very much looking forward to that centennial commemoration, uh, but I, I like to think that George's memory will be with us as we commemorate that centennial, and more importantly than that, the legacy of his life and his strength and his contributions can be seen in his daughters. Uh, most, uh, and we're joined uh, today uh, by his uh, his wife Hurik, as well as um, his daughter Nora, who's with us here, Nora Hovsepian, who many of you know, uh, who's been such a stalwart leader of the Armenian community uh, and a champion of justice and a champion of uh, recognition of the Armenian genocide. He's also survived. Uh, by his daughter and son-in-law, Neva and Benjamin Clark, and their children, Patil and Kyle, uh, as well as uh, Nora and Vikan's uh, daughter, Arev, and many, many others uh, who knew him, knew his family, and were impacted uh, by the work of, uh, of his family and the strength that, that he showed and the inspiration that he gave to all of us and will continue to give all of us uh, even uh, after his passing. So it's with it, with honor and with sadness that I ask that we adjourn in the memory of George Kalebjian. Thank you, Mr. Kakorin. Any other adjournments? I see none. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.